I'd like to thank the, the organizers for having given me this formidable task, but it's, it's a pleasure, of course, to, uh, to give the, um, the final uh, or the concluding remarks. So it's, it's really been challenging, not just preparing the talk itself, but trying to you know, absorb at least some of the information that we got from these this excellent talks. And it's been really hard for me, maybe it's just you know, my brain being very limited, but also I think that the amount and quality of the talks and the amount of information and the, I would say, the, the, the symbiosis between the two communities, the exoplanet and the um, seismology community, has been, it's been really great. So the, I've really listened with, with a lot of interest to, to all the talks. Um, now, what I've tried to do to get a little bit inspired uh, for the concluding remarks is just to generate a, a word cloud from the abstract book. And, well, as you see, everything is, is basically what you expect. So you see Kepler and Corot very prominent there. Um, and just for the record, Kepler appears 250 times and Corot 150 times. Uh, and then the other prominent words, of course, are planets and stars. And clearly, stars is the prominent one. The reason, as Victor uh, reminded us um, this morning, is quite obvious. I mean, you can study stars and you can perhaps do that not necessarily having to characterize a planet that orbits a star, but you cannot learn uh, or, or characterize the planet ignoring the, the star itself. That's why stars are so prominent. So really what I'm going to insist on uh, during this, uh, these remarks is this connection between, um, between the two communities, which for me at least is it, quite, it's quite new in the sense of, of uh, you know, being at a conference where the two communities are there, are there and are trying to, uh, to work together. So, uh, but I, before I, I focus on that, I just wanted to say a few more words about this uh, photometry revolution again. So I'll start with the slide that, that, uh, that Ron presented on, on, on Monday morning. And I think on, on this one, I'll have to agree with, with Ron and slightly disagree with Jan in the sense that I think the, the revolution, at least as we've uh, known that so far, is perhaps really over. But this is by no means a negative uh, you know, statement. I think we're entering an era where we're starting to look at the details. We start to, you know, stress testing models. Uh, we're probably, hopefully, starting to work at a more reasonable pace. And this is, this is excellent. We're, we're going to have and find exciting results, but probably in some cases, the, let's call it the low hanging fruits have been picked. There will be more, uh, of course, and a few of those we heard about at this conference. But perhaps we're entering a sort of different, uh, a different era there. Uh, I was also wanted to, uh, also wanted to, um, uh, to use this, well, <laughs> this occasion somehow to thank people that made this revolution possible. Uh, PIs of the missions have been thanked already, but there's also a few other people who, of course, invested part of their career in, in supporting the missions. But also, I mean, the revolution was possible uh, thanks to you know, the work that lasted for decades of people developing stellar models or developing the theory of oscillations that we are actually still using. At least 90% you know, of the things we're doing are based on work that was you know, carried out throughout decades. So that's also uh, people we should be uh, thankful to somehow. Uh, in terms of, again, the revolution and the way we're working, I remember a few years ago, I think it was 2010, uh, in Porto, well, in, Porto, in Portugal, in Ponte de Lima, there was a nice workshop there, and some of us were presented the first results, uh, the very fresh results from Coho, and Douglas Goff was there, and he said, well, I'm going to, of course, I'm not going to use his words because I will degrade this English to my level, but what he, what he said was basically, go ahead, have fun, but, you know, sooner or later you'll have to start doing things properly. And, and I, think, <laughs> I think now it's what we're starting to do. And there, again, some examples at this conference have clearly shown that we are uh, trying to do, uh, and we're doing things uh, with a little bit more detail. OK, so what about solar-like oscillations? Uh, this is a case where perhaps the, you know, as I said, the low-hanging fruits have been picked in most cases. So we are starting, on the other end, as I said, to look at things that are even more exciting to some extent. And well, an example, of course, is uh, the fact that we clearly see that models uh, that include effects of you know, uh, rotation on the, the transport of angular momentum are, are just wrong, and not by you know, 20% is order of magnitude. So this is great because for, for once we can really show that the models are wrong and are very wrong. So this will you know, entail a lot of sort of development in the, uh, in the stellar physics community to try to come up with more realistic models. Another is, example is what we just uh, shown the presentation by Sebastian, we're starting to get you know, to a level of details where we can set constraints uh, at least on, on the size of the, uh, of the, of the cores uh, during the main sequence, uh, which is, as Sebastian said, is still a sort of parameterized way, a way of, I would say, of parameterizing our ignorance, but still this is going to be extremely useful uh, when trying to determine ages for you know, thousands of stars. We need to know uh, the duration of the main sequence, and this is, this is crucial work. Uh, another line of research we, we heard 
uh, quite a few talks about that, are these uh, I'll say synergies between large-scale spectro spectroscopic surveys and, uh, and seismology. And this is leading to some, some interesting results. But again, we're just at the beginning of that. And there were talks about uh, you know, using or collaborating with the Gaia ISO uh, survey. Um, Mark just gave a talk about Apocask. Uh, there's also prospects to uh, work with, uh, with the LAMOS people. And uh, don't forget about, you know, uh, strobing photometry can also lead to uh, very interesting results. So this is also a part that I uh, sort of find sort of a new development compared to, to other conferences. But what I was really uh, struck by are the results on classical pulsators. This is just beautiful. And uh, the, re the presentation by, by Tim and also the results by, by Don Kurtz and collaborators are, are are fantastic. I mean, the fact that we can detect very robustly, I would say, the, uh, the period spacing, and also maybe a hint of, of glitches there as well in the period spacing in gamma dorado stars is just fantastic. To, to be honest, I, I, I thought I would never <laughs> see that in the, in the data, at least in the models it sees. Uh, and what is also wonderful is how you can really see uh, the effects of rotation, of very slow rotation kicking in. And, and you see them, uh, you detect splittings, and you also see another effect that was uh, predicted by the theory is the fact that you can have, uh, when rotation starts to be relatively large, but still very slow in these stars, uh, you can see a period spacing that depends on, on the period itself. So this is, this is just beautiful. Um, what about Delta Scuti stars? Uh, well, Tim promised to, to solve Delta Scuti stars at this conference. It will maybe take a few more months, but there are certainly encouraging results there, and Constanze presented uh, uh, some of them. And, um, but of course, we have to remember, and I think Matteo uh, raised that issue that the cases where we, you know, we're tempted to interpret or we find very simple patterns are perhaps not really representative of, 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 the, of the physics in, in most of those stars. So A stars are, you know, fast rotators. And in that case, we cannot just simply apply, you know, uh, uh, or I would say simplistic approach to trying to interpret the data. But much more sophisticated uh, interpretations are, are probably needed. And Daniel uh, gave uh, an excellent talk this morning about that. So I'm happy that you know, very smart people are working on this problem. So it, it will be eventually uh, solved and we will get a handle on those, but perhaps not, not yet. Um, yeah, so now I'll just switch to the main um, point that I wanted to make or to stress from this conference. What I really found new is this, this symbiosis, as I said, between the, the uh, exoplanet uh, and seismology and astroseismology community. Uh, just to remind everyone what symbiosis is in, is with, it's, well, uh, in nature there are beautiful examples uh, of that, but there are also different categories of, of symbiosis. So the first one is parasitism. Um, and although I remember some fierce discussions between uh, you know, the exoplanet and seismology community at the Corot Weeks to well, define or decide which field to point to, I think we, we never got to you know, a level where we were calling each other parasites. But then, <laughs> then in uh, another type of, uh, which is a little bit more interesting, of, of symbiosis is what is called commensalism. That means basically sharing the same mains at the same table. And that's really what, what happened in the last few years in the sense that the two communities were sort of obliged to coexist because they were feeding from the same data. So we needed the same observational technique to detect planets and to detect oscillations to uh, a parts per million level, which is what we want. But now things really are evolving into something even more interesting, which is named mutualism that I just discovered yesterday on Wikipedia, of course. Uh, and that's when the, the two, uh, I would say, organisms, they, they mutually uh, somehow benefit one from the other. And this is really what is happening now. So I'm just going to give a few examples from, again, I just picked a few talks. Uh, this is not necessarily representative of all uh, we've, we've heard of. But there are some, some challenges that we share or some effects, like you know, very sort of have simple effects that we see in, in both communities. That this, this beautiful results about pulsating binaries presented by Simon, for instance. Uh, and also, well, the, the, uh, I would say the, the, the amount, incredible amount of information you can get out of TTVs, although there are some challenges, as, as we've heard. That's something somehow common to the, to the two uh, communities. Another challenge that we're facing, uh, perhaps not the most interesting, but still is something we'll have to, to cope with, we are you know, dealing with large samples of, uh, of data, of stars, or planets. But of course, we have to be very careful when we try to you know, find or look for correlations between properties and parameters. We have to be very careful about selection effects. And that happens in you know, both when studying population of planets, but also uh, stellar populations, as, as Luca reminded us. Of course, well, although the, of course, the important message is in, in the small scripts, but it's really perhaps a tedious uh, work, but it's something that we necessarily have to 
uh, to take into account. Then, of course, there's, you know, uh, symbiosis are more interesting and more relevant, and the, the obvious ones uh, are the fact that with seismology we can uh, determine precisely and accurately uh, stellar uh, properties which are crucial to characterize planets. And this was very clearly explained in quite some detail by, by Victor this morning, so I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, on that now. Uh, another uh, connection which I found perhaps to some, well, somewhat for me at least more surprising is that when you get to the details of what you really need to, uh, you know, to, to learn about planets or stars and you get to the physics there, there were talks about by sorry, Isabel but also about Matthew Havel about you know, the structure, the internal structure of planets and their evolution. When you get to the physics and the uncertainties we have, they're, they're quite similar, though of course they're not necessarily identical in stars and, and planets. And what we've learned, or at least I've learned from this conference, is that there's it's going to be a lot of connection also in, in uh, in advancing actually in the physics is the same uncertainties, of course, as I said, in perhaps in different, slightly different conditions that affect both uh, our models of, of planets or some planets at least and stars. So, and, and this will really have to, uh, uh, and hopefully will lead to an even closer symbiosis between the communities. Also because as, as we were reminded, for instance, by, by, by Stefan, the planets and stars are not isolated, they, they do interact. And at some point, if we really want to to get to the details and have a deep understanding of, of the system, uh, we will have to take into account interaction, tidal or magnetic interaction that was uh, explained by, uh, by Stefan. Um, now we'll end with one of the big challenges that we are, have to face, getting accurate ages, uh, which is what we, we've of course written in the, uh, in the specification for Plato, uh, ages accurate to 10%. We're gonna get there, but this is a huge challenge. Uh, and while well, Savita you know, talked a little bit about um, the uncertainties or the, the prospect of trying to get uh, basically an age determination for stars, Jennifer Van Sadis also gave, I think, an excellent talk about gyrochronology and insisting on the limitations. And, and in seismology, we have to be also aware of the limitations that, that are there. And the, the way forward, of course, is that eventually well, we will reach that, but to reach that 10% accuracy or not precision, we will certainly need to have a better well, the need for better stellar physics, as Mark uh, uh, reminded us uh, earlier today. And to build this more realistic stellar model, this is going to be a, a big challenge that I think will take us a decade or, or even more. So this is, you know, looking a little bit about the future, this is going to be maybe another sort of revolution, maybe a quiet one, but it's, 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 it's going to be very, very much needed. Uh, so just my last slide is to remind everyone that, I mean, personally, I really appreciate it, as I said, it is symbiosis between the two communities, and I guess the next occasion to, to continue on, on that is the Plato Conference uh, at the end of the year in, uh, in Catania. And I also added a small quote, perhaps not the most erudite quote, but I think it applies and gives a, a nice prospect for, for the future of this symbiosis. And thank you.